Nancy, um, we would like to announce that uh, you have won uh, the Lifetime Achievement category of the Ocean Awards. Oh, uh, my. <laughs> Those are the sort of announcements that leave me speechless, making it hard for me to say anything. But obviously, I'm incredibly honored uh, and pleased. Um, you know, those of us in this field, we don't do it for the awards, but we certainly we we can't help but be happy when when people recognize that what we're doing is making a difference. So thank you so, so much to the Blue Foundation. I wonder if, Nancy, you'd like to explain how you normally introduce yourself, how you normally explain what you do. Well, I, I'm both a scientist and a, an ocean advocate. Uh, so part of me works to collect the information we need to conserve the ocean. But I spend a lot of time increasingly now actually uh, making sure that information gets out to all the places it needs to get to, the general public, policymakers, uh, really the world at large. So uh, the Smithsonian, where I've uh, worked for many years, has a motto that our job is to increase and diffuse knowledge. And I think that's a pretty good description of what I do. And you've also worked at the Scripps Institute. You were its founding director, is that right? I was the founding director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So when I first arrived there, there was a lot of conservation being done, but it was all scattered around the institution and the whole was definitely not greater than the sum of its parts. So I created the center and uh, with, with the help of uh, many colleagues and a whole educational program, which was really the the first one to bring the natural sciences together with the social sciences sciences with an explicit goal, not just to document the problems, but to find the solutions. Well, I think that's what people will find so amazingly interesting about your life, because this is a story of our life. And um, not that you've come to the end of it, but this is the story <laughs> of it so far. And um, I think the, the 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 career arc that you were describing to me was uh, so interesting because the the first part of it you spent um, writing the obituary for the ocean. Can you explain what you you mean by that? I'm a coral reef scientist, um, and I started my work in the middle of the 1970s, and I was working actually on the north coast of Jamaica. And uh, back then, the reefs weren't in perfect condition. In fact, there weren't very many fish there at all. But the, the corals, the reefs, the structure of the reefs was, was fantastic. It was beautiful. And you'd go on a dive and you could see corals as far as, 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 far as you could look. Uh, but then in the 80s, not long after I started working on those reefs, they essentially disappeared. Uh, through a combination uh, in where I was, a hurricane, but then a series of diseases, which actually affected reefs, not just in Jamaica, but around the Caribbean. So that by the mid 1980s, we, we'd gone from a situation where 70% of the bottom had been covered with living coral to less than 10%. So I really saw sort of a reef obituary very early on, my, early on in my career. And of course the news just kept getting worse. And so I spent decades uh, giving talks, uh, giving testimony about the plight of coral reefs and what we needed to do to, to save them. Um, but when I got to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I started teaching students and I came to realize that um, just talking about all the problems, which is what I'd been doing up until then, wasn't really what they wanted. They wanted to, they wanted to know what they could do. They wanted to work on solutions. And so I started thinking of this program that I was helping to create as a kind of medical school for the ocean, if you will. And yet in medical school, we don't uh, teach students how to write obituaries of their patients, even though all the patients, of course, wind up with obituaries eventually. Uh, and, but that's what I felt like we were doing. We we're teaching our students to write ever more refined obituaries of nature. And, and so that's when I started getting interested in the successes and the solutions. And what, when I started digging into it, what I found was that there are actually a lot of successes, not enough, of course, but there were plenty of successes. And in fact, most of them were very poorly known even to the scientists working in ocean conservation. So that's what really launched me on this journey to focus, not on the doom and gloom, but on what's working, why it's working and how to do more of it. 
and out of that, which came out of what, 20 or 30 years experience, out of what came out of that was something called hashtag ocean optimism, which we many of us have, have heard of and, and see cropping up on, on Twitter. Ocean optimism was actually the result of a collaboration because like essentially any good idea, it's usually you're not the only one to have it. And I was contacted by uh, Ellen Kelsey uh, in the US that she, who wrote, was very concerned about environmental depression in children. And, uh, and she brought uh, together um, also um, Elizabeth, um, Heather Coldaway. And uh, so the three of us uh, started talking about our shared experience about the fact that although the ocean was in trouble, that there were quite a few successes out there that nobody was really paying attention to. So we had a workshop, it was a really tiny workshop outside of London. And so we hatched the idea of having a Twitter campaign. And, um, and we you know, went back to our home bases and voted by email about what the hashtag should be. And uh, hashtag ocean optimism was a winner. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history, because it really took off, despite the fact that we didn't have a a PR budget for this. We just essentially wrote to our friends and colleagues and said, "Ocean uh, World Ocean Day is coming up. Can you tweet with hashtag ocean optimism about some of the successes instead of all the problems? And it just took off from there. I think now it's been used by something like 45,000 different Twitter accounts, ranging from just small individuals to big, big media organizations. Um, and NGOs. So it's been a huge success. And, and it remains, ironically, it remains one of the best ways to find out about what's working in the ocean. And I can go every day and look for hashtag ocean optimism on Twitter and almost certainly find something that's working that I didn't know about before. And I've written actually scholarly papers uh, that review all the different examples and what they suggest we, uh, in terms of what we need to do now. And um, and so, and, and even more broadly than that, I would say that there's been a real shift in the conservation, in the conservation conversation uh, from one that is focusing on the problems to one that's focusing much more on the solutions and successes. And I don't attribute all of that to hashtag ocean optimism, but I think it's been part of a, a wave of a recognition that people really want to do something and, and, and really horrible stories are sometimes actually quite important and useful in terms of motivating people initially, but in the end, they, people need to know that there's something that they can do that'll make a difference. And if they feel like the problem is so big that you know, there's nothing they can do, I think that most people would rather just go to the bar or wherever they go to forget about problems that they, they can't do anything about. And as it turns out, that's actually a phenomenon that's really well known to social scientists. Uh, if you give people huge problems, it sometimes can make them angry, but if you don't give them solutions, in the end, it leads to apathy rather than action. I find this fascinating. So, I mean, maybe we should just go back to um, some of those places um, in uh, Jamaica, and you were in Panama, I think, with Scripps, was that right? And studying uh, 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 studying coral reefs in the, in the Caribbean, which is some of the most damaged in, in the world, uh, is there anything to be optimistic about now? Have you seen some good examples of, of good practice that brought stuff back? You're right that the Caribbean is kind of a, uh, what we, in the United States at least we call a basket case in terms of coral reefs. There's so much damage uh, and many places really aren't on a trajectory of recovery, but but there are places that are doing much better than the, than the average. Those are sometimes called bright spots. And in fact, there's a whole science enterprise now devoted to studying bright spots to figure out what makes them bright. I'll, I'll give you one specific example, which is in Bonaire. Uh, Bonaire is a country with uh, beautiful reefs, but it was affected uh, quite badly by a number of things, um, including overfishing and a bleaching of that. The thing about Bonaire is they recognize that their economy depended on healthy reefs. People go to Bonaire to go diving. If the reefs are all dead, they won't come. And so over the course of a number of years, they enacted a, a several different kinds of policies. They have a marine park, which is paid for by, uh, in order to go into it, you have to pay a, a fee. Uh, so the costs of running the park are paid for by the people who use it. They instituted restrictions on spearfishing and on fish traps. 
and in general, just just started really paying attention to the things that were needed um, to keep the reefs healthy. And as a result, the reefs in Bonaire are in much better condition and in fact have recovered for the, from those um, bad events that had them going down for a while. Now I'll come back to op optimism because I think it's such a great theme, but in passing, I, I really can't leave out the census of marine life because I spent a lot of time writing about it as a, uh, a journalist, and it, it produced endless uh, stories over over the ten years it it, it it happened. Can you explain to people who don't know what it was, or um, have only just come across it, uh, what it did, and why it was important? The Census of Marine Life was a ten-year program to figure out what lives in the ocean, what used to live in the ocean, and what will live in the ocean. So some of it was. Uh, basic marine biology, discovery of new species. Uh, some of it was looking back into historical records to figure out what the ocean used to be like. And then some of it was modeling and policy work to figure out how to have a healthy ocean in the future. So it was very wide ranging, many, many countries involved. I was part of the, a, a team that was focused on coral reefs. And we actually didn't start the census of coral reefs until 2005, about halfway through the entire census program. So we knew, uh, Coral reefs host something like a quarter to maybe even a third of all the species that live in the ocean. There's no way we were going to census everything on coral reefs in five years. Um, but what we wanted to do was figure out the methods that would allow one to uh, study diversity of coral reefs in the future. So we developed these uh, little structures that um, they're called autonomous reef monitoring structures or arms, but I like to think of them as kind of underwater condominiums that you put down on the seafloor and let them stay there for a year or two and then bring them up to see what uh, is living there. It allows you to sample diversity of the ocean and, and coral reefs in this case um, without doing any damage. So that's the part I was involved with. So the, the, I think what the census did was really shine a spotlight on biodiversity itself and the creatures that live there. We often talk about the ocean as in terms of, it, of the ecosystems that are out there like coral reefs or seagrasses or mangroves um, or the deep sea. There's a lot of work on the census uh, associated with deep sea uh, communities. But um, this was a focus also on the species themselves, which we tend to do a lot of on land. After all, we have conservation of um, in the United States of condors and uh, in China of pandas. Uh, but this was an effort to do the same thing for the ocean where the species tend to be maybe a little less charismatic, although they're pretty charismatic to me, uh, and bring that wonder of ocean life uh, to, to the public as large as well as to the scientific community. It remains the case that most ocean species still haven't been studied and don't even have a scientific name. But we're making progress, and um, and it gave me an opportunity to write a book called Citizens of the Sea, which I really enjoyed doing because it allowed me to put in one short uh, volume uh, with wonderful pictures taken by people from around the world. Everything that at the time I thought I had learned over the course of my entire career, uh, this was 2010, um, that I thought was really cool about the ocean, and put it in one little book. And uh, it was a it was a great opportunity to do that as well. The, the funny thing about that book is it continues to sell pretty well, which is unusual for a book that's now over 10 years old. But the really funny thing about it is I've had many people tell me that it's their two-year-old's favorite book. <laughs> and, and I wrote it for grownups. I didn't write it for two, three, four, or five-year-olds. But it's turned out there's a huge market in parents and grandparents who have budding marine biologists that they want to share the ocean with. And it seems to work on both le levels. The kids like the pictures and the grownups like the text. But you've got it, it's it's all the animals you write about, which you're writing about writing about as if they were animals on land, but they're animals in the sea, and people aren't used to reading that because there aren't any books like that. Yeah, I, it's it's um, it's. I mean, I, it's, people do like ocean animals. It's just that, uh, that sometimes uh, there's not the same emotional. There's a sort of a gee whiz aspect to it, but not maybe a little bit less of a kind of emotional connection. Uh, I once read a review of Finding Nemo, which said, you know, who really cares about fish until they hit the grill? And, you know, there's a, I think that's a terrible way of thinking about it. But 
Um, but there is that element to the way people respond to organisms. If they are furry and have big eyes and look at you, they tend to get more of an emotional response than the things that are covered with scales or even you know, the invertebrates like shrimp and corals, which I study. But I've noticed a change even in uh, the last 30 years, possibly as a result of some of the things that you've been involved with, uh, a change in attitude uh, about fish. People used to say to me, you'll never get people interested in fish. They're, they're, they're cold blooded and they don't, they're not cuddly or furry. People can't relate to them. But now the, the, the airwaves are full of television programs about fish. Something's happened. Yes, I mean, I think the best example of that is what's happened with sharks, uh, which after all uh, started their notoriety with a, with Jaws, which was a, uh, the first um, sort of summer blockbuster film. And that's how people viewed sharks. And, and now there's an enormous interest in uh, conserving sharks. So there's a lot of interest. That's not to say sharks are out of the, uh, out of, trouble. I mean, there's still a huge problem in terms of conserving sharks, but, but the whole attitude about them has completely changed. Um, one of the best headlines um, I can remember from the New York Times had to do with this shark tourism phenomenon. And it was actually taking place on Cape Cod, which is where Jaws was originally filmed. And there's this memorable line um, for people who have seen Jaws that we're going to need a bigger boat. And so the headline in the New York Times was, we're going to need a bigger gift shop. And that's because of the money that sharks bring in to tourism. And in a country like Palau, it's been estimated that a dead shark is worth about $150 in terms of the value of its fins. Uh, but a live shark over the course of its lifetime is worth about $2 million. So you don't really need a PhD in economics to realize that. Uh, protecting sharks is good business. While we are while we're on the subject of, of fish, do you eat them? I eat the occasional fish, but I tend to eat low on the food chain. And so I'm actually much more interested in eating oysters and mussels than I am eating fish. Um, but that's the seafood I primarily consume. And those are great because they don't need to be um, they don't need to be fed if they're raised in agriculture. They just filter the seawater. They actually make the water cleaner. They're, they're really low on the food chain. There aren't as many also animal welfare issues associated with eating um, things that live between two shells and don't really have much of a brain. So I, I personally am more comfortable eating those for a variety of different reasons. But I also respect the rights of people to choose to uh, eat eat fish. And I live in Maine where there's a really important um, seafood industry and people's lives depend on it. And uh, the whole the whole economy of, a, of, the, of someplace very near to where I live in Maine is dependent on lobsters, for example. And so I think the key is not to say you shouldn't eat something, but to, to manage our taking of living organisms from the ocean responsibly and ethically. And, uh, and then individuals make a personal choice as to what they are willing to do. There's a very pessimistic film going around, uh, which you may or may not have seen, but it's really uh, the general point is, the case, is, is, is what I'm trying to talk about, We're called Sea Spiracy, where um, it is extremely pessimistic and it, it ends up with the conclusion that, that we should not eat fish because none of them are harvested sustainably. Do you buy that? No, I actually don't buy that. I, I haven't seen the entire film. I've seen bits of it. And, I've, and there's been a lot of commentary about it. Um, it's, you know, I, I, uh, there, and there, and there are pieces of information that's just simply aren't correct in the film. And so as a scientist, that bothers me because it's so easy to get those in, pieces of information correct. There's no need to say things that aren't true because there is a big problem with fishing. There's plenty of corruption, there's plenty of overfishing, and there are plenty in, in terms of the big corporate actors, uh, but there's also you know plenty of overfishing in terms of small communities of people that are poor and just trying to feed their families. Um, I can never forget being off, off the coast of Haiti on a scientific expedition and having a, a guy come up in a dugout and he actually had a little fire in his boat his wooden boat because he was actually eating what he was catching because he was so hungry. So 
I, I think to say that we shouldn't eat any fish is not the solution. That conclusion is also there are a number of fisheries that are are actually being well managed. And uh, the lobster fishery is well managed. And there are a number of major fisheries that are well managed as well. And there are a number of small scale artisanal fisheries, which are run, they're co-managed by, uh, by local communities that are working as well. So to say that nothing is well managed is, um, is crazy, I think. I mean, some people won't eat fish at all simply because they don't eat animals. Um, I eat very few animals. I, I think that's one of the best things you can do for climate, for example, is to eat a plant-based diet. So it's, it's, it, um, it operates on a variety of levels for me, but to say that nobody sh should eat fish would, among other things, condemn millions of people in small, uh, poor coastal communities around the world to starvation. And on, on that subject of science, I mean, there's quite a lot going on, science and climate. Science and the science and climate. I mean, the 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 two uh, things, climate science and and ocean science, have, have seemingly uh, uh, operated on entirely parallel paths without crossing for a while. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe we've got some views on that. But I noticed that recently they've converged in a very big way, with a paper uh, authored by. Enrique Sala and a number of other people, including Jane Lubchenco, who's been taken on by the Biden administration, uh, saying that um, what we didn't know or, or, or any of before, I don't think we suspected, but we didn't know that uh, that trawling um, creates massive carbon emissions. Um, you're aware of that. You may even have been involved in its creation. Um, I wasn't involved in the creation of the paper, but I have certainly read it. Um, and it's a very important paper. They, um, they talk about essentially using strong marine protected areas uh, covering about 30% of the ocean uh, in order to achieve three gains uh, for conservation. One is biodiversity protection. One is uh, sustainable fisheries, because of course, if you overfish the ocean, it doesn't, it, you, if you're left with just minnows, there's not much to eat. And then one is climate and, and marine protected areas um, have a major role to play in, in solving all of the, the challenges for all of those areas. Uh, so it's really a nice paper in that regard. It, it, it doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but it provides a framework that allows different uh, countries or uh, regions to work together to figure out what's the most important to them and how to achieve it within that the context of the of the strategy they outline but it was a really surprising result uh that uh trawling was uh such a big part of the climate solution i'm sure there'll be people that go on to look at that really carefully and you know refine the numbers that happens that's sort of the part of the course for science but there's almost no question that disturbing the seafloor does release um, uh, carbon that might otherwise be buried. And, um, and so it's, it's an important perspective that needed uh, uh, to have a spotlight on it. It's quite a confusing uh, a process though, by which the, that carbon uh, either gets into the atmosphere or into the sea and whether that matters. It, it's, it's quite, it's quite a complicated thing to study, isn't it? Because some of it, uh, as I understand it, gets into the atmosphere, and some of it is just um, uh, vented into the sea, preventing it absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. Is that is that correct? Right. When we emit greenhouse gas emissions, some of it goes directly into the into the air, um, and in fact, it starts all this most almost essentially all this starts in the air, but then some of it dissolves. Um, at the sea surface and goes into the ocean. That's actually, that process has actually kept our air cooler. It's also, however, changed the chemistry of the ocean, uh, bringing it in the direction of uh, more acidity, which has all sorts of problems on its own, completely separate from uh, warming temperatures, which is the result of having the carbon dioxide in the air. Um, and then the whole process of um, what's called carbon sequestration, so carbon sequestration, which is burying this carbon on the seafloor, has to do with all the organisms that 
die and fall to the seafloor and then are buried. The same process happens actually in shallow water. Uh, for example, mangroves and seagrasses are, all, are also really good at burying carbon and keeping it there. And so all of these aspects of the ocean actually have an important role to play in terms of slowing down climate change. We obviously have to reduce emissions as well. In fact, that's most of what we have to do, but you know, we're, we're in a race against time essentially. And so anything that makes us go a little faster is a good thing. So we don't do anything or very few things only around the coastal margins and mangroves and so on in the world. Do you think we're gonna do more things in the sea to uh, deal with the climate crisis? I think having that study um, out there with those numbers to be digested and refined and thought about in terms of what their implications are in terms of, okay, what are you actually gonna do in terms of policy? What, what areas do you wanna protect? What are the best areas to protect in the context of burying carbon in the, in the sea? Um, I, I think it's, I mean, the fact that Jane is now part of the Biden administration is and, and with a portfolio, a, a climate portfolio, means that she's gonna take that information and that, and that strategy that was outlined in the paper that she was part of and, uh, and, and, and start the process of getting it translated into policy. So yes, I do think there will be changes. But what do you think she and, and Biden can do? They can certainly promote marine protected areas, for example. That's, a, that's, the, um, that's the sort of central, central piece of this uh, paper, but they can, she can also uh, work in terms of uh, sustainable fishing in addition to marine protected areas. In other words, there's, there's more to fishing policy, a lot more to fishing policy than just marine protected areas. There's also just sort of managing fishing uh, in terms of uh, sort of economic and uh, technical uh, strategies to make sure that it's at the right level and we don't fish too much and therefore lower the amount of fish we have to eat. Um, and so she'll, I'm sure, will be given her amazingly broad experience in terms of fisheries generally, since she was used to be the head of NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, you know, there, there are all sorts of policy areas within the, the government where um, they can set things up so that um, fishing is done in a way that promotes uh, a healthier climate rather than uh, working in the opposite direction. It's a, another card stacked against certain forms of fishing, isn't it? Uh, not least the uh, awesome and off the scale uh, emissions of the Chinese trawling fleet. Yet yeah, trawling in general is, is problematic because it's, it's not just problematic from a climate perspective, it's problematic from a, um, from a destruction of the habitat perspective. It's like clear, people have likened it to clear cutting the, clear, clear cutting the seafloor. So there are all sorts of reasons where, uh, for worrying about trawling, but I, I don't feel like the, the paper is saying no trawling. What it's saying is make sure parts of the seafloor are protected from trawling uh, to, uh, in, in order to achieve the, the climate goals that we want. So I don't think it's, ending all trawling is what that paper is about. It's about protecting a third of the seafloor. That is what the paper is about. And we don't protect anything like that at the moment, do we? Uh, in, in terms of that kind of protection, no trawling, I would suspect it's somewhere below 3%. Yeah, and, and that could, you know, even increasing, I mean, there's this big movement, I'm sure you know about it, the 30 by 30, which is the protect 30% of this, the land and 30% of this, the sea. Uh, by uh, 2030, and um, you know that if we achieved 30 by 30, that would that would be a big thing. That would be a great achievement. Nancy, you've talked a lot about uh, optim ocean optimism and some of the things that went right that we never hear about. Um, could you give us some examples of those, perhaps in 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 terms of some of the species that you've been studying? Well, there are some amazing stories of recoveries of ocean species. Um, the, the census of marine life told us that uh, there used to be so many turtles you could practically walk on them. And obviously that's not the case now, but thanks to a number of efforts to protect eggs and reduce the catching of turtles in, in fishing nets, uh, 
that two thirds of all turtle populations are actually on the road to recovery, something that is a scientific study that is very poorly known by the general public. And some of these recoveries have been very uh, dramatic from a handful of, of individuals, a handful of nests to hundreds or even thousands of nests. The recovery of the green turtle in Florida, for example, is two to 3,000 fold increase in numbers, big recoveries. So what, what hope is there for things like the vaquita and the northern right whale, which are hanging on by a thread? They are hanging on by a thread. And um, I, the case of the vaquita is particularly tragic uh, because it's, uh, the numbers are so small that I, I just, I don't know if there's hope for the vaquita, but there are people that are still working on it and they're doing their very best. The North Atlantic right whale is also holding on by a thread. Its numbers are larger than the vaquita, but the problem is if current trends continue, the, the North Atlantic right whale will go extinct. So we can't let current trends continue. But there, but there, see, I, I don't ever mean to imply that there aren't species that are in a crisis situation. There are. Your optimism uh, is is not unlimited, but it it is, it is optimism for some of the trends that we're seeing. Absolutely. Um, sometimes it's a question of things getting bad more slowly, which seems like a first kind of optimism, but that's the stage you have to go through before things start to get better. So it's really important to recognize that as a positive trend. And there are just a number of examples of things where numbers of species are, uh, numbers of individuals in a species are, are increasing or habitats are being recovered. There's some amazing examples of the rebuilding of seagrasses, for example, in, in Chesapeake Bay, where people have gone out and literally planted six million seeds and with remarkably successful results. So you can restore habitats if you put your mind to it. And uh, there are also things that, unexpected things that, that happen when you save uh, a species or a habitat, uh, the, the, the knock-on effects, as I would call them, or trophic cascades, as, as, as scientists might call them. I believe you've got some good examples of that. Things that, you know, when you let nature rip, uh, you've no idea where it's going. Um, can you fill us in on some of those? The sea otter is a great example. It was the southern, uh, the southern sea otter was so decimated by hunting that it was thought to be extinct. And then a handful of individuals were found, it was protected. And now there are, you know, well over 3000 sea otters. Now those sea otters, support a great tourism industry in Monterey Bay, but they also eat sea urchins, which is really important because sea urchins eat kelp beds. So you can have these, um, what are called trophic cascades, you know, more sea urchins means less, uh, more sea otters means less sea urchins and less sea urchins means more kelp. So they can have unexpected uh, positive benefits. You've been, uh, very multidisciplinary in, in, in your interest in, in, in your area. Um, how wide does that go? Does that go into the arts? You've gone into the social sciences. What, what, do, you, what do you bring to bear? And what, where, what are your sources of inspiration? Well, I'm not an artist myself, but I'm very interested in the role the arts can play in conservation. When I was at the National Museum of Natural History at Smithsonian in Washington, DC, I co-curated an exhibit called the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef. And this is a project uh, that is run by a group and uh, two twin sisters actually in Los Angeles called the Institute for Figuring. And what it consisted of was a about four meter by four meter by four meter coral reef made out of individual crochet pieces from people from around the community uh, assembled. Part of it was in bright colors to represent a healthy reef. Part of it was white to represent coral bleaching and part of it was made out of plastic to uh, represent pollution. Now, what was really interesting about this exhibit was the people that brought into the Natural History Museum who normally don't go into Natural History Museums, including some people that don't really go into museums much at all. Part of the project involved working in homeless shelters and getting women in homeless shelters to create crochet pieces for this uh, reef. And one of the best pieces 
maybe the best piece of press coverage I've ever had was one week the the newspaper Street Sense, which was a is a weekly newspaper by and for homeless people. The front page headline was homeless women stitch their way into the Smithsonian. And that's really what I want to see ultimately when it comes to conservation. So are you now, uh, you are uh, uh, some years into, nearly a decade into ocean optimism. Are you, are you more optimistic or less optimistic about the state of the world's oceans? Uh, I think I'm more optimistic. I'm, I'm not a Pollyanna, so it's not like I'm trying to say there are no problems. There are actually, there are huge problems. But I think I'm more optimistic for a couple of different reasons. One is, well, certainly on the climate front, although we still are you know, heading in the wrong direction, what's happening now with renewable energy is breathtaking. And it's happening much, much faster than people predicted. Even, um, I mean, Norway is a classic example where something like half of the new cars are now plug-in electric vehicles. And it's clear that transportation and the sense of cars is really moving strongly in, in, in the electrification direction. And, and it's also the case that um, renewable energy in terms of sun and wind power is, is now so inexpensive that it doesn't need government subsidies to make it a viable option. So, so just, I, I feel like in the climate side of things that there is a lot of reason to, I mean, we need to move faster, but but we're moving in the right direction and we have solutions, economic and economic solutions, which we didn't have 10 years ago. So that makes me super optimistic. Um, you know, the science in general makes me optimistic because we now have a much better idea what to do. And also, and all the technology associated with remote sensing, we can keep track of things now so much better than we used to be able to keep track of. But I think the real reason I'm optimistic, is not the science and technology, it's the changing attitudes of people and, the, and also our better understanding of how, what it takes to have people work with nature instead of against it. So we've learned a ton about the importance of, of local communities working together um, and, um, and, and many of the great fisheries success stories in terms of um, uh, people around the world uh, making a living sustainably have to do with this process of people coming together and figuring out what they want to do rather than having it be imposed by uh, the government. And I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then, and then just, I mean, the other thing is that people really care. Uh, the, the reason that film, whatever its strengths and weaknesses might be, is getting a lot of attention is that people are really, they have their antennae up about what's going on in the environment, including in the ocean. Uh, and I have to say, I'm, well, I'm, a, I was, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. So I grew up protesting the Vietnam War. And, uh, and then for really for decades, I feel like young people were, were just not engaged in, in social issues at all, much less the environment. And that is really not the case now. But the fact that there's a generation to a young generation to work with is the source of, for me, incredible optimism. And, and then finally, it's the, the realization that positive change can happen really, really quickly now. And, and, so things, and, and, and so things that seemed impossible, even as I said, a couple of years ago are now reality. So this whole transition from impossible to implausible to inevitable, it, the, the time frame is really shrinking. And that's, oh, that's wonderful news as well. I'm working on constructive, realistic optimism, which shines a spotlight on what's working and, and uses what's working to, to create more success uh, without denying or looking away from the many problems that are still there. It's a big difference. So, um, in, in in the in the context of, of so again, so in the context of realistic optimism, um, what are your top five big ocean problems? Um, what, what do you think we should be focusing on? Top, well, five is actually a big number, <laughs> depending on how you define it. Uh, certainly, we have to focus on plastic. I think 
that's the problem that we know is a big problem. Uh, and it's much more than, you know, as that movie Seaspiracy points out, it's a lot more than just straws. Uh, and uh, we don't have a solution. Less than 10% of plastic is being recycled. We don't really have commercially viable alternatives to plastic on, a, on the scale, the scale, the economic scale that's needed. Uh, and, and so we, I'd, unlike the, the climate situation with respect to say renewable energy, I don't know exactly what the solution to plastics is gonna be right now. So that's something we really have to worry about. We still have to worry about um, fishing and uh, just the fact that some fishing is sustainably managed. We need all fishing to be sustainably managed. So that's still a big area. We need to increase the size of uh, marine protected areas. And, um, and then, you know, most perhaps what's really important is we need to make sure that the people that depend on the ocean, benefit from ocean protection. Because if we don't have that, then we're actually never gonna really get ocean protection. So you, you, you want us to protect 30% of the ocean, and that's a lot of people, a lot of people want. But how do we, how do we uh, make sure that we manage uh, fishing and other activities in the 70% that is left? How do we uh, get that a little bit that's for nature back into our management of fisheries? I actually think it already is in principle in our management of fisheries. And that's what's, I mean, it's a kind of nerdy term, it's called ecosystem-based management, but that's about, the, the essence of that is that you're managing fisheries in the context of the fact that those fish live in an environment and have connections with all sorts of other creatures as well. So I think we actually have the principles for doing that. It's really more a question of applying them than it is uh, sort of inventing them from whole cloth at this point. Yeah, but when it comes to something like, you know, the, the management of the bluefin in the Pacific or the yellowfin in the Indian Ocean, um, we have these concepts like maximum sustained yield and the precautionary principle and the precautionary principle is meant to stop you going too far with the maximum sustained yield and these aren't working nobody's applying them um that bit that's for nature is not in the equation properly um are you confident that we, we've already got the tools here well the situation with things like tuna are really challenging because they're such high value species that it's hard to manage them for anything other than the dollars that they bring in. Um, so it's really in the case of a something like a, a bluefin tuna, it's more about being willing to back off the fishery so that the stocks recover. And that's that's politics rather than science. I do know that there are efforts um, like large um, island, uh, uh, small island developing states, which have really large amounts of ocean as part of their uh, economic, exclusive economic zone, are certainly trying to manage fisheries, including tuna fisheries. And of course, there's all this new interest in the high seas where a lot of these really valuable species spend part of their time. So, and, and the prospect of having a high seas agreement uh, out of the United Nations. So it's, it's, it's not there. I, I, you know, that's why I said when I, you asked me what the five big problems were, um, fishing is still a big problem. It's not solved. But, but I guess I feel that every time we have a successful fishery that's managed properly, it provides more ammunition for fixing the ones that are still a problem. And certainly we need to do something about the high seas in order to, to protect um, the 30, you know, 30 by 30 depends on uh, having a high seas part of the protection. It's not just the high seas. I mean, there's a lot that needs to be done much closer to shore uh, within countries' uh, economic boundaries in the ocean, but, but certainly the high seas is part of the solution as well. So I, I spent a month 
on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the Southern Line Islands. Now, these are places that are so far away from people that there's no problem with pollution. There's no problem with fishing. It's just not worth the gas to get there. And so they're as close to pristine as you can imagine for a coral reef. Of course, they are affected by climate change, including by mass mortality, by coral bleaching. But these are places that have the ability still to bounce back and to, to dive in a place that has been untouched in a direct sense by people is amazing. We had to get out of the water uh, by four o'clock in the afternoon because that's when the big sharks come up from down deep and you don't wanna be on the menu. Uh, and to, to spend hours of every day swimming with sharks and manta rays and big groupers and snappers and have the fish come right up to you that's a, it's like a traveling in a time machine to what the ocean used to be like, but it also gives you a vision for where you could take a time machine into the future and make the ocean like uh, when we start doing conservation right. And will we ever get it right? Well, people are people. We'll never get everything perfect, but I think we're, we're I think we'll improve. Let's put it that way. Fantastic. Nancy, thank you very much indeed.